Good morning, everyone. We're going to pick back up here in chapter three. So um, hope the test went well for everybody. I might have a few more comments about uh, the test and kind of moving on from the test towards the end of class. But um, we kind of left off at the end of section 3.5 on determining formulas. The remaining part of chapter three is actually probably the most important and the most uh, 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 probably um, recycle topic you're going to see in a bunch of different classes. Stoichiometry is the, the sort of study of what we can quantify from a chemical reaction. This is going to be the one topic that we're going to hopefully learn really, really well because you're going to see it in chapter four. We're going to see elements of it in chapter five. You're going to see elements of it in a lot of other uh, chemistry classes in 1220 and some of those topics. Um, most of organic chemistry in lab, you're going to be balancing, uh, forming something from something. So you're going to have some kind of chemical reaction that you're quantifying the aspects of. So you're going to see aspects of stoichiometry uh, more or less forever. This is probably going to be the one topic hopefully we never even forget because it's going to be so uh, common by the time we get through it. And hopefully it's one that you've already seen before. So I think even the word stoichiometry, does anybody not ever recall hearing that word before? Is that stoichiometry? Is anybody ever hearing that for the first time? Like I don't see any hands. So, so I think everybody's uh, sort of seen or heard the, the topic before. And so the idea just kind of begins, we can have a reaction, we can balance the coefficients, like say 2H2 plus O2 go to two water. We've talked about balancing reactions already, so we understand the business that this is kind of the before, uh, what's present before the reaction, this is what's present after the reaction. The big deal with stoichiometry though will be that in the lab, we can mix together whatever concoction of H2 and O2 that we want to mix together. We don't have to mix two parts H2 to one part O2. We can have a lot of H2 and a tiny bit of O2. We're just gonna get a tiny bit of water to form though if that's the case. We're going to have a lot of the hydrogen left over. We can also have the opposite. We can have a tiny bit of hydrogen and a whole lot of oxygen present in the reaction. And then we're gonna also just have a small amount of water form and we're going to have a lot of that oxygen left over. So we can always kind of choose one of these reactants where we can think at the molecular level, at the molecular level, I need two H2 molecules to react with one molecule of O2 to produce two molecules of water. But if I happen to have, let's say, let's say I mix together three H2s and one O2, I probably don't want to necessarily start thinking about changing the coefficients whenever I start mixing together a random amount of reactants. So I might try to think just in my head or and with some math skills, how can I try to balance or try to figure out which one of those reactants is in excess? And if we have three H2, one O2, I think you can see pretty easily there's one H2 in excess. But the one key I want us to think is that we're not going to change these coefficients. We're gonna leave those coefficients alone. We're gonna either do math, we're gonna do maybe dimensional analysis, maybe we'll set up a chart. The book calls uh, some charts like a BCA chart, lab uses these charts too. So you may have seen one already. Uh, but we'll show you how to set those up as we go along too. We, we can also think of the mole level. So we can also say that two moles of H2 will react with one mole of O2 to produce two moles of water. So the mole to molecule uh, is just a conversion factor. So we can imagine uh, reactions taking place at the molecular level. That's maybe easy for us to picture in our minds to get kind of a picture of a single molecule of O2 reacting with two individual molecules of H2. Mole level, probably gonna take us longer to picture 6.022 times 10 to the 23 O2 molecules, but I think we can picture the ratio of one mole O2 to two moles H2, producing two moles of water. We can also think of this at the gram level, that two moles of H2, the molar mass of H2 is 2.016, so call it about 2.0 grams per mole. So if we have two moles of H2, that's about four grams. If we have one mole of O2, the molar mass of O2 is two oxygens, so the molar mass here would be 32.0 grams per mole for the two oxygens added together. And so we start the reaction, if we have it balanced where we have two H2, two moles of H2, a mole of O2, that would correspond to 36 grams of reactants. And then we're gonna produce 36 grams of product because we're forming two moles of water where we're 18.0 grams per mole for each of those moles of water. We're forming two moles of water, so that's our 36 grams. So just kind of seeing the mass balance, that we're starting with a reaction that's balanced, we're converting the mass of those molecules in their form of H2O2 into water and not creating or destroying mass. 
Okay, so let's get into first maybe a picture type question that we can look at. And some of these are kind of like old exam questions. We don't necessarily have to do this as a multiple choice question or it's kind of meant to show us this is like an old exam question where we're looking at a reaction here where we have N2 plus 2O2 goes to NO2 and specifically 2NO2 if we balance the reaction out. And so in this reaction here, N2 is represented by the black spheres, so these are the N2s. And then the O2s are represented by the gray spheres. And so we have our N2 and our O2 reacting here. And here we have a random collection of molecules that's given to us by somebody that's prepared this kind of box for us, where we have N2s. So I have two, three, four N2s. And then notice in the case of O2, I have one, two, three, four, five, six O2 molecules. Let me write molecules more clearly. The reaction said I should have for every N2, two O2s. Now again, that doesn't mean I have to mix together that ratio. We can mix together whatever ratio of these reactants we want to mix together. And in this case here, specifically we have four N2s and six O2. So can we try to figure out which of those two reactants there's too much of? Which one of them are there too many molecules from which we can have this reaction take place with? Well, we can sort of maybe think about lassoing out. Like imagine we take two oxygens. So I'm going to take two oxygens and then one N2 and combine them together. So I'm going to take that specific count. So I'm going to lose these three molecules. I'm going to lose one N2, two O2s. And in their place, I'm going to form an NO2. And I'll just have the O's kind of not completely shaded. So that's my two NO2s that have formed from that collection of two O2s and an N2. And so the original molecules that we reacted are gone. The products have formed in their place. The other reactants are still there. I just haven't sketched them in yet. And so let's do this again. So let's kind of lasso out another N2 and two O2. So this is just taking the reactants and the ratios that they have to react by. So for every N2, I got to take two O2s. So I do this again. So I'm going to get another NO2, another NO2. And then what do we have left over still? So I haven't reacted two N2s and two O2s. I think you can hopefully see where this is heading, where we have these three that can react, but then I have, I'll use green, to represent one N2 left over. So I have one nitrogen that I don't have enough O2s to react with it. So I'm going to have one nitrogen molecule left over. So let's draw in an N2 molecule and then two more NO2s. And so in total, I have one, two, three, four, five, six NO2s that I've sketched into place. And then I have one N2 that remains. That remaining reactant is what we call the excess reactant. the one that's left over. I have four N2s. I'm supposed to have twice as much O2 to react all of the N2. So that would mean I would have to have eight oxygens to react with all of the N2. I only have six oxygens. So that makes oxygen here what we call the limiting reactant. So oxygen is the limiting reactant. It's the one that limits the amount of products that can form. So we're limited in how much product can form by how much O2 happened to be present. If we had two more O2s present, I could have reacted that last N2 to make two more NO2s. And then if I added more oxygen, then oxygen would be an excess. So we kind of have three possibilities. We have two reactants. So I could have N2 in excess, which is what we have in this problem. So nitrogen could have been an excess. We could have had the case where oxygen's in excess. If we had the case where we have, you know, say, uh, nine or more oxygen molecules present, then O2 would have been left over. And nitrogen would have been completely consumed in this problem. 
But then we also have the third possibility, which would be if we exactly have the right ratio, if we have for every N2, two O2s, we'd call that the stoichiometric. We'd have the stoichiometric amount of the two reactants. Neither one would be in excess, and both of them would limit the amount of product that's formed, and both would be completely consumed. So in a problem like this, this is like a particle diagram is often meant to be a problem where we can sketch things out. We can think on, uh, about the reactions at the molecular level. We can think about 1N2 reacting with 2O2s, replacing them with their products. Uh, we can do this on a problem like this that we can't really do when we give you like six moles of this thing and four moles of this other component and you have Navagadro's number times six molecules. It's gonna take us a while to lasso out all the molecules. But moles and molecules are proportional to each other. So we can sometimes, and maybe it's useful to think of moles as that ratio to molecules. So sometimes we'll think about moles like they're molecules, but we have to separate the idea that a mole isn't a molecule. A mole represents an Avogadro's number of that molecule. So if I have, uh, if we did the same problem, but what we're trying to picture having four moles of N2, six moles of O2, the result's still the same, that we would have N2 in excess and instead of having one N2 molecule in excess, we have a whole mole of N2 in excess. Okay, so this answer here would end up being six NO2s form. We have the one N2 in excess. We can picture this out um, and by sort of uh, going molecule by molecule, trying to count up and account for each of those reactants. Now, probably the easier approach is going to be to use math. So the next kind of examples We'll get into trying to put math into practice so we can use either dimensional analysis or set up a chart of some type to help us solve these problems. So the idea of stoichiometry will be, well, what if we give you the mass of a reactant? Let's say we are picturing some sort of reaction where we have, you know, A um, go, you know, plus B goes to C plus D, let's say. And so we have our coefficients in front of A or coefficients in front of B in front of C and D as well. And so the way this problem, or the way we might start thinking about stoichiometry will be, we can give you the mass of A, and we can use the molar mass of A by having a periodic table available to add up its uh, uh, atomic weights to get the molar mass. We can use the molar mass of A to convert to moles of A. We can use our coefficients. We can use the coefficients in the reaction to convert between moles of A and moles of B. Um, so let's say A here is equal to 1, let's say, let's say B is equal to 2. What that would mean is that for every A, we need there to be two Bs present. And so we're going to use these coefficients here as moles. So this would mean one mole of A would react with two moles of B. If those are the coefficients, say 1 and 2 for A and B. So we're going to look at the coefficients in our reaction to go from moles of one substance to another. And then we can use molar masses to go back to mass. So we can start to ask questions like, how much B in grams is required to react with so much A in grams, where we're going to have to do these mole-to-mole -mole conversions and hence use molar masses of A and B along the way. So this is the basic idea of stoichiometry here, being able to go from grams to moles using coefficients that convert between moles and the molar masses that go back to grams. Okay, so let's start with this reaction here. So we're gonna start with hydrogen and nitrogen reacting to form ammonia. And so we're gonna balance this reaction, hopefully pretty easy balancing. So two nitrogens on the product side to balance the two ends. That gives me six hydrogens, so three H2. And so I'm going to be balanced here that three H2s react with one N2 to form two NH3s. If we're doing a stoichiometry problem, we have to balance our reaction. So if you have a reaction that's unbalanced, we have to balance those coefficients. We're going to need them uh, for the reaction. And so some of the questions we could see to kind of get into the surface of um, some things we might ask, how many molecules of N2 are required to react with six molecules of H2? A question like this, you might be able just to look at this and answer it. You might be able to kind of look and see, well, if it's for every three molecules of H2, I need one N2. For six H2, I would need there to be two N2. So you may be thinking here that this is two N2 molecules. And that would be the answer. But now how can we show that or how might we back that up with dimensional analysis with a simple problem to make sure we can maybe see how we can see that answer 
and then just see how we could get there with dimensional analysis. Well, the number of molecules of N2 that we're solving for, that's what we're looking for. We start with our six molecules of H2, and we're just using our coefficient here. Our reaction says for every three molecules of H2 that react, we have to react with it one molecule of N2. So of course that's going to be equal to two molecules of N2 reacting with the six molecules of H2. So dimensional analysis is usually pretty easy to apply for uh, dimensional analysis as long as we're kind of thinking of this idea of these coefficients being the reacting coefficients in the case of molecules or even in the case of moles. If this question had said how many moles of N2 react with six moles of H2, the answer would be two moles of N2. So if you switch this to mole and then ask this for mole instead of molecules here, the answer would still be two moles of N2 with the math being the same. So we would have the coefficient that three moles of H2 react with every one mole of N2. Sometimes, like if it's been a while since you've had chemistry, moles and molecules always confuse the students. But remember, molecule is just at the individual level, like one single entity of, of two nitrogens bonded together is one molecule of N2. And a mole is just an Avogadro's number. Three moles of H2 is just three times Avogadro's number. So when we have, say, six moles of H2, that's just six times Avogadro's number of H2. So we need two times Avogadro's number of N2 to react with it. How many molecules of NH3 are formed by this reaction? Well, for every three molecules of H2 that react, we get two molecules of NH3. So we should be getting four molecules of NH3. And again, if we just want to double check and make sure we can use dimensional analysis here with a pretty hopefully straightforward example. Number of molecules of NH3 from six molecules of NH, uh, six molecules of H2. We're just using our coefficient for every three molecules of H2 that react. We produce two molecules of NH3. So that's where we're getting four from. Now, the, I mentioned the BCA chart. I just want to set up one of those real quick. Now, this stands for before, change, after. So before the reaction, after the change that takes place due to the reaction, and then what's present following the chemical reaction. And so what we want to write in before Whenever we're writing in here, we either have to write in moles or molecules. We have to write in whatever the reaction, its reacting unit is. It's not going to be grams. So the key here would be just don't write in grams here. Write in moles or molecules. So if you're starting a BCA chart, the B should always be either if it's in grams we have to convert those into moles or into molecules and so um, and then also what we're going to write in here is kind of the math so this is what we're actually given so the the information that goes in here is our given moles or our given number of molecules and again if we're given grams we have to use a molar mass to get that given number of moles so we're not writing in like the three and the one the coefficients here that's not what goes into the bca chart so in case you're getting confused on where do I use the coefficients, where do we use what's given? Well, let's do what's given here. We're given six molecules of H2. And in the um, question of how much N2 reacts with it, so this is kind of relating to the change. Now the change, the X, the X just means for every, like, um, for every 3X of H2 that we lose, we're losing 1x off of N2, but we're gaining 2x in the case of ammonia. So our coefficients are coming into place here. And then so we have minus 1x for N2, minus 3x for H2, and 2x for NH3. And the x is just the ratio. It just means however much H2 we're losing, for every 3 we're gaining 2 in the case of NH3. And our reactants are minus 
So we're losing the reactants, and then the plus, we're gaining the products as the reaction takes place. And depending on the nature of the problem, we may not, like, so for the case of the first part where we're like, how much N2 reacts with that much H2, we don't know initially how much N2 we need. That's what we're gonna solve for. And so uh, the first problem here might be, well, if we're gonna consume all the H2, we're gonna take it from six molecules down to zero, can you solve for X? So this would be like if we're trying to figure out either what X is, so we can solve for how much N2 reacts with it, we'll just solve for X. So negative six is equal to negative three X, so X is equal to two. And then, so we're losing two off of N2. So N2 would initially have to be two, so we could lose two to go down to zero. And then if initially we have none of the ammonia present initially before the reaction takes place, we're gaining two X. So we're gaining four molecules here. So we have six molecules of H2. We could solve for X, comes down to two molecules is what X is equal to. And then so in order to lose two off of N2 and go to zero, so it's completely consumed, we would have to have two molecules of N2 initially present. And then if we initially have no ammonia, we're gaining two X, so we're getting the four molecules of NH3. Now, BCA chart, I think, has its place in problem solving. It's not, like, this problem here I don't think is a great BCA chart problem. If you're a little confused, I'll show you in a later example a problem with the BCA chart that I think makes a little more sense and can help us understand the problem maybe a little better than this one can. But a BCA chart is just a way for us to try to figure out what's present before, what information do I have, how can I relate the coefficients. The big part of the BCA chart is just these relationships of the change. And if they can help us solve a problem, that's great. There's other ways we can solve problems using dimensional analysis or just by picturing what's going on in a chemical reaction. So let's take a look at this example here. So here we have um, the oxidation or the combustion reaction of glucose. Um, so the formula plus O2 goes to CO2 plus water, so a combustion reaction. So how much CO2 is produced in grams when 2.50 grams of glucose reacts? Now, when I see a problem where I'm asked grams of one of the reactants, I'm given grams of one of the reactants, I'm probably not thinking BCA chart here, because if I want to do a BCA chart, I'm going to have to convert this quantity that I'm given here to moles and have to then set up the chart probably not the first type of example I'm gonna to think to run to a BCA chart. Here I'm going to think dimensional analysis. I'm gonna think about that opening slide of grams to moles, moles to moles, moles back to grams. So here I'm gonna think how many grams of product form, how many grams of CO2 form, that's what we're looking for. So starting your dimensional analysis with what you're trying to solve for is always a great first step. So that's what we're looking for. We're given 2.5 grams of C6H12O6. Well, the ratio is for every one mole of that, we form six moles of CO2. So that's why we got to use a molar mass to go to moles. So we can use molar mass of C6H12O6. So I'm going to take 12 times, or 12.01 times 6 plus 12 times 1.008 for the hydrogens, plus 6 times 16.00. So that's And so again, we just have to use its molar mass to get its number of moles, but we need the number of moles because it's the next step. We need to be able to go from one mole of C6H12O6 when it reacts, produces six moles of CO2 from our reaction here. And then one mole of CO2 has a mass of 44.01 grams, 16 times two plus 12.01. So 
but you can, some of you are already calculating this. So I get 3.66 grams. of CO2 forms by the combustion or the oxidation of 2.5 grams of glucose. So fortunately, we're spinning CO2 into the atmosphere too, so, so we're to blame for, for global warming, sorry. But, uh, but anyways, so that's how we can calculate how much CO2 is formed uh, in this reaction. We can also go the other way. We can say, well, if you produce so much CO2, does that, can you tell how much glucose had combusted? So how much, of the C6H12O6 was required to have produced, let's say, 25.0 grams of CO2. So this is the same problem, but here we're just going to solve for the number of grams of the reactant that's needed to produce 25.0 grams of CO2. So we just go back to moles of CO2 using its molar mass. So just again, 12.01 plus 16 times 2. If we get in the habit of not writing units in, it's very easy to get our coefficients backwards in stoichiometry. So just get in the habit, I think, of writing out the units very clearly, grams of CO2 to moles of CO2, moles of CO2, so it's six moles of CO2 to one mole of C6H12O6. With multiple choice exams, I can tell you a question like this. We would have the right answer as a choice. We would then have the right answer times six times six, where if he had gotten that divided by six and said multiplied by six, that's always a choice. And surprisingly, it'll be taken by like a quarter of the class almost every time. So just make sure to write these coefficients and your units in, because it becomes very easy to not make that kind of mistake if we're just tracking those units throughout a problem. I got 17.1 grams. Now, I could ask the question, what if we wanted to set up a BCA chart on this one? How might we have done that? So if I wanted to set up a BCA chart on this problem here, goes to 6 CO2 and 6 water. So the only thing I might do is start with the before in grams, but I really need the before in moles. And so I'm going to have to take this times, you know, the 180.16 grams per mole. And so I'm going to want to do that math. So that's 2.5 divided by 180.16. And so that's 0, 0.01388, call it 139. So 0, 139 moles. And so now this is kind of a good place to begin the problem because my change is all in the ratio of moles, not in the ratio of grams. So that's like the worst part of a BCA chart is if we throw the grams in, we don't convert it to moles, and then we put in our, you know, minus x and plus, you know, 6x, for example, we're going to probably make a mistake and not realize we need to convert to moles. We just have to convert to moles, and then our coefficients would look like this. Presumably, we have enough oxygen for this reaction, so we're reacting this with an excess of oxygen. We're not worried about the O2. The problem doesn't begin with any products present. And so the coefficients here would look like this. So we're going to consume the glucose down to zero. If we did so, then x is just equal to 0 0.139 moles. 
So we can determine X like right off the bat for this problem. Because if we're consuming all the glucose, that's why after the reaction it goes down to zero. And so then what is six X equal? What is six times that quantity of moles equal? Well, just times six. So that would be 0 0.0833 moles of CO2. And then it's 44.01 grams per mole. So times 44.01 is 3.66 grams. So I get the same mass as above, so we're getting the same answer. Don't let BCA charts confuse you. Let them be a, a tool that can help us understand what's going on in the reaction. Let it be like a, a, a tool we would have in our arsenal to help solve a problem. This problem, I think, is longer with the BCA chart than the dimensional analysis, but it might help us understand the problem. It might help us understand the reactants are being lost, the products are being gained. Um, so the, the thing that you really gain, I think, from a BCA chart is just kind of seeing what's going on in the reaction and seeing that a little bit better. So hopefully it helps us understand what goes on in the reaction, even if we don't necessarily go to that as our go-to problem-solving technique. Okay, so the remaining part of the chapter then gets into quantifying details like, you know, how can we quantify things like what is the limiting reactant, what is the excess reactant, how much of the excess reactant remains, for example, might be something we want to calculate. We might want to worry about calculating yield. What's our percent yield of the reaction? So our percent yield is just simply whatever our actual yield is. So a reaction sometimes doesn't yield every bit that it was supposed to. So our actual yield over our theoretical yield. This times 100%, that's what we mean by the percent yield of a reaction. The theoretical yield is the one that you get from stoichiometry. Sort of like how much yield were you supposed to get following the, the reaction, for example. The previous question could have said the actual, excuse me, the, the theoretical yield of CO2 was 3.66 grams. So for the previous reaction, we could say, for part A, where we were given 2.5 grams of glucose, the theoretical yield of CO2 would have been 3.66 grams. So that could be our theoretical yield. And then if we had only gotten like 3.50 grams, then you could calculate the percent yield. So the percent yield, let's say, if you know 3.50 grams a CO2 forms from that 2.50 grams of the glucose, what is the percent yield? Just to make sure we see this topic of what percent yield is, it's a pretty easy topic. It would just be, well, we only got 3.5 grams. The math on the previous page said we were supposed to get 3.66 grams times 100% would be 95.6% yield. So that's a topic we'll see presented um, in a quick example later, kind of just like this one here, where we can expect sometimes that a product could be lost along the way. There could have been a byproduct that formed instead of the product that we desired. Um, that could limit the amount of product that had formed. So let's look at a, a question like this one here, where we have 15 grams of N2, 2.5 grams of H2. They're reacting by that same reaction we were looking at earlier. And so we're being asked to kind of address which reactant is the limiting reactant, so which one limits the amount of product that's formed, and then how much product forms in grams is our question. And so whenever we have a limiting reactant problem, I can tell you that there's going to be multiple ways we can try to solve that problem of identifying the limiting reactant. How might we go about this? Well, 
One way might be convert the given quantities to moles and kind of compare the ratios. That way is always a little tricky because in my head sometimes I will make a mistake on which one is really in stoichiometric excess, but that's one way. We could calculate their moles, look at them, try to see which one there's too much of. Um, but there's a, probably a faster way that we could go. We could probably just say, well, why don't we try to solve the problem? Why don't I just make as much NH3 as I can make if I consume all of the N2? And that's going to assume we have an excess of H2 to do so. So take all of the N2 and convert it into product and see how much we make. Or figure out how many grams of NH3 we would make if we consume all of the H2. Assuming we have enough N2 to make that quantity of product. And so this is probably a way that you guys might remember solving this type of problem from high school. I kind of remember this is how I remember learning stoichiometry for this type of question. So the way this would kind of work is that what we're doing here is we're saying, well, just go grams to moles, one mole to two mole, and back to grams. So for N2, we use the molar mass, 28.02 grams per mole of N2. Occasionally, whenever we have N2 or O2 or H2, students get confused if we use the mass of 1N or 2N. Just remember, you're using the molar mass of N2, so two Ns. So we're using the molar mass of the whole group of two nitrogens, so 28.02 uh, grams. And so then the ratio would be one mole of N2 will react with an excess of H2. Assuming there's enough H2 to react with it, it will react with the H2 to form two moles of NH3. And then one mole of NH3 is 1.008 times 3 plus 14.01, so 17.03 grams. So let's work that out real quick. So that's 15 divided by 28.02 times 2 times 17.03. So that would give me 18.2 grams of ammonia. And again, this assumes an excess of H2. You know, that assumes we have enough H2 to produce that quantity. That's the one part of this problem we have to keep in mind, that we may not be able to get to this quantity if we've run out of the other reactant. So let's go through the problem consuming all the H2, then assuming we have an excess of N2. And so if we run through this problem with H2, and you may all already be looking, there's already a telltale sign that we can't make 18.2 grams. If you're already kind of thinking that this quantity can't be made, you're on the right track. But we're going to go 2.016 grams per mole of H2. For every three moles of H2, according to the reaction, we're going to produce two moles of NH3. This assumes we have an excess of nitrogen to produce this quantity. If we run out of nitrogen, we're not going to get to this quantity. And then we're going to do the same conversion, one mole of NH3, 17.03 grams. And I get 14.1 grams. Now, we just have to think our way through this problem. If we're thinking, when we hit 14.1 grams, is the moment I've run out of H2, but I still have N2 left. How do I know I still have N2 left? Well, because I could have made even more NH3, presumably if I had more H2. So to get to 18.2 grams of NH3 would take more H2 than what we have available. Because I consume all the H2, I only make 14.1 grams of ammonia. So 14.1 grams, this becomes my uh, theoretical yield, if we want to call it that too. So the theoretical yield of NH3 would be 14.1 grams, not 18.2, because we've actually run out of H2. We run out of H2 at 14.1 grams of ammonia. 
So we, we're just taking the two reactants and seeing what's the most amount of product we can make assuming an excess of the other reactant, and we run out when we make the lesser amount of product. So we run out of that first reactant at 14.1 grams. We've lost all the H2, so that's why 14.1 grams is the most we can get. Now I said before there's a telltale sign that 18.2 was impossible, and it would have been that we had only reacted 15 grams and two and a half grams of reactant. So the, you know, we already were creating more product than reactants we had reacted. So we were only starting this problem with 17.50 grams of reactants. But let me also point out that a question like this on a test, if we say, what's the most yield of ammonia you can make, one of the choices is almost always 17.5 grams, where you just add up the two reactants. That would be the answer if this happened to be the stoichiometric amount of each of the reactants, but it's not. So we have an excess of N2. So N2 is an excess. And then H2 is the limiting reactant. So the limiting reactant is the one that's completely consumed. It's the one that limits the amount of product that's made. It's the one that if there was more of, we would make more product. So our limiting reactant is H2. And then the amount of ammonia that forms is 14.1 grams. So the yield we'd expect here is 14.1 grams. Okay, now we flip to this question here. It's almost the same question, or it's going to ask the same question we already addressed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a, a third question after this. It'll was the question I thought this was. So this one's getting back to yield. So for the yield, we have the same mixture of masses of the reactants that had reacted from the previous page. And so we worked out that that yield from the previous page is 14.1 grams. So our percent yield, so our theoretical yield, the maximum yield we expected was 14.1 grams. So our actual yield was 12.2 grams. Our theoretical yield is 14.1 grams times 100%. So our, the, uh, our uh, percent yield. is 86.5%. Just again, a second example on calculating yield. So the, the next example gives us the same quantities again. And it's asking the same question, limiting versus excess reactant. But, the, but this problem is asking us a, sec, uh, a different second question. It's asking us how much of the excess reactant remains following the reaction. And so now for that question, let's kind of go back and readdress the limiting reactant problem and kind of think about how we might figure out the limiting reactant a second way. Um, this one here, maybe we can use a BCA chart. I still think we can use dimensional analysis too, but let's start with our BCA chart. And so if I'm doing a BCA chart, I'm going to convert the, the grams of N2 and the 2.50 grams of H2. I'm going to convert those to moles. So 15 divided by 28.02 would be 0 0.535 moles of, of N2. And then the moles of H2, 2.5 divided by 2.016, that's 1.24. And so then my change should go minus x minus uh, 3x for H2. And then initially having none of the NH3 plus 2x for NH3. So then one of these is going to go to 0. The question is which one of them. So another way to think through the limiting reactant problem would be well, if this one goes to zero, what would x equal? So if N2 goes to zero, x would be equal to 0 0.535 moles. How much H2 would be left over? The remaining H2 would be negative, right? Because we'd go 1.24 minus 3 times 0 0.535. That'd be negative. 
it would be negative 0.364. Can't go negative, so that doesn't make sense, right? So that, that's one way you can see with the BCA chart that we're not going to zero here. So we're going to go to zero in the case of, of hydrogen. So let me erase this math here. So if hydrogen goes to zero, then 1.24 minus 3x equal to zero, that's when it's equal to zero. Hydrogen completely consumed. And so we can solve for x. So just algebraically solve for x. So negative 1.24 divide by 3x. So x is equal to 4. Point, uh, excuse me, x is equal to 0 0.413 moles. And so then I can plug that x in here. So then the amount of excess reactant that remains after the reaction is completed for the case of the excess N2 would be 0.535 minus 0.413. So that's 0 0.122 moles. So from the chart, I can see how many moles of the uh, N2 are remaining. I don't need to calculate this quantity per se for the NH3, but if I want to know where it went, I'm forming 2 times 0.413, so that's going to be 0.826 moles of the product, so that's where the reactants went, was forming the product. But so the amount that remains, 0.122 moles in terms of mass, so I have 0 0.122 moles of N2, 28.02 grams per mole. times 28.02, I have 3.42 grams of N2 remaining that are unreacted. So we had 15 grams of N2, and we have 3.42 grams left over after the reaction completes that's, that's completely left over. I consumed the difference. So the amount that was consumed was the 0.413 moles of N2. So we can see the, there's a certain quantity of a reactant that can be consumed, and then the difference is what's left over from what we initially had present. Now, I mentioned that you could also use dimensional analysis for this. So I mean, every problem is going to have more than one solution. So what I might then say is, well, what if you want to approach this problem one other way? What if you want to say, well, how many grams of N2 reacted. Like, let's even then say, imagine you go back to not knowing the limiting reactant again. Let's say you go back to this problem or maybe, maybe a different problem where you have two given reactants and you don't know which one is in excess, which one's the limiting. Then just pick one of them and see how much of it will react with the other. So let's pick how much N2 will react with all of the H2. And if you get lucky and just kind of have a good way of guessing the limiting reactant, then we know the limiting reactant, so I'm going to guess it. Then we can start with the limiting reactant or a good guess of it. 2.016 grams per mole of H2. For the reaction, it's for every three moles of H2, we need to react with it. One mole of N2. One mole of N2 is 28.02 grams. So we do this math. at 11.58. Now, the only down, like dimensional analysis is by far going to be the go-to problem-solving technique we probably use the most for these types of problems. We just have to make sure we think through the problem, that this is how much N2 that reacts with that much H2. So 11.58 grams of N2 reacts with 2.50 grams of H2 is a conclusion from that step. And so then if we want to figure out how much N2 remains, the 
equals the initial amount minus the reacted. So we initially had 15 grams minus 11.58 be 3.4 grams. I don't know if showing you two or three ways to solve every problem is adding to the complexity or taking away from it. Hopefully it takes away because if every problem we can think and understand three different ways to solve it, then we're that much closer to having a way to solve a, a, you know, every problem on this topic correct on the test. So hopefully you have three different ways of thinking through a problem, all of them leading you towards the same correct answer. Okay, so um, kind of wasn't sure where we'd be at in class today. So why don't I let you guys try, try the next two questions and I'll start kind of working through them in a couple minutes so we can double check the math. But try the next two questions for the, the two questions. The quiz password for today is stoic. Um, and then there's a couple like survey questions on the exam just on like if you thought the test was harder than you expected or easier or whatever. Um, and then some things you might be thinking about towards uh, midterm two. A few things I might just say before we maybe tackle these questions, we may not even have time for the questions. Maybe I'll just ramble and we'll do these next time actually. Let's actually do this. Uh, let's not worry about the next two questions. I'll throw those at the start of class for Friday. Let's just talk a little bit about where we're at in the class, kind of how we might fine tune how we're gonna prepare for midterm two, kind of having gone through midterm one here. Um, I know you guys haven't seen scores yet, so hopefully scores will be up by probably Thursday, Friday this week, so that you can see them uh, before the weekend. Um, scores probably aren't going to be as high as everybody wanted them to be. The average was is probably heading towards like a 70-ish. Like I really wish we were tracking towards an 80-ish. Midterm two is going to be harder. I can just tell you guys that right up front. Midterm two's topics are just harder. Doesn't mean we can't get there. Doesn't mean we can't learn the topics just as well or not better than the way we learn midterm one's topics. Um, what things work for you guys may be different for the audience on in the room too. So for those watching this at home, I think an important question to ask yourself would be how much better off would you have been if you were here? And then for those of you guys that are here, you may be asking the question, well, how may I be better off for bits or two? What might I do differently to prepare? Do I need to read more? Do I need to rewatch lecture? There's supplementary lecture videos. I don't know if anybody stumbled across those. If you want to hear somebody else's lectures, maybe before or after ours, just to have a second kind of round of lectures that you could watch, those are on Carmen. You could check those out. Uh, reading, I think chapter one is so kind of, chapter one has so many weird topics that it's hard to focus and read through. I think when you get into like stoichiometry, the reading is almost like a requirement where the reading is very closely connected to all the examples that we do. They're really closely connected to the practice examples in the book. I think you'll see as we kind of continue along, the readings are a little bit easier or more connected to the lecture examples and the practice exam problems you're gonna see. I think practicing more problems, doing more quizzes, testing yourself is always going to be beneficial. So I just think as you head into midterm two, just um, you know, for what worked for midterm one, keep doing those things. And, but if you didn't get the score that you wanted to get, just try to think, what's something we can fine tune to get us towards that better understanding? Because you know, understanding each topic inside and out is not as hard as it sounds. Like maybe, maybe that sounds, maybe I'm making it sound like it's easy and it's not. Um, but I think it just is a matter of just trying to understand the concepts, understand the problems, and trying just to not feel like there's some shortcut. I mentioned this before, there's really gonna be no way for like midterm two that we're just gonna study the weekend before the test and it's all gonna come together. Just too many topics. But if we start now, we start today, you guys are starting today, glad that you're here. Um, I think that's a good starting point, but I think just getting to a point where we can take practice exam level questions like this weekend, as opposed to you know two or three weekends from now, will get you better off towards uh, a great score on midterm two. So I really just wanna say that I hope midterm, midterm two will be harder, but I hope the scores go up. So there's no reason why just because the test kind of kicks up a notch in terms of the topics just becoming a little bit more challenging doesn't mean we can't rise to that moment and uh, kick its butt too. So uh, if you look at today's survey, if you want to get into it, there are a couple survey questions just on how hard you thought the test was. 
uh, a couple surveys on what you might look towards, um, or I, I think it's asked like what sort of things did you do that were successful for midterm one, and a couple survey questions that might be um, interesting for me to see what you guys think about um, the class. If you have any feedback for sure, um, I'd be happy to read through that. And so then, like I said, we'll pick up from this problem the next one next time. But um, but I think we're going to knock midterm two out of the park. That's my my goal. So I think it's yours too. All right, that'll do us for today. Thanks, guys. We'll wrap class up with this.